So we're now going to demonstrate how to apply some of the key operators in the Flowable class in the context of case study EX1. And this particular case study shows how to use various RX Javable Flowable features dealing with back pressure strategies, which as you may recall, were the missing buffer error latest and drop strategies that are going to have a publisher generating data at a rate faster than a subscriber can keep up with it and the publisher will run in one scheduler context and the subscriber will run in a different scheduler context. And this is what happens when you have back pressure unaware publishers and subscribers and you have to deal with that. The subscriber has to find some way to handle that. So we're gonna take a look at the code in the EX1 project in my reactive flowable folder in my Live Lessons GitHub repository. So we're now in my project for case study EX1, and let's go ahead and open this up in IntelliJ. Uh, as you can see here, this is going to generate a bunch of events from a publisher that's not back pressure aware, and it's going to then send that to a subscriber, which is running in a different scheduler context, and they'll coordinate uh, by using the strategies to figure out what to do with the consequences of data arriving too fast to be published from the publisher to be dealt with by the subscriber. So we've got a couple of fields here. We have something that keeps track of the number of items that are pending. They're basically gonna be the items that are kind of queued, waiting to be processed by the subscriber. We're also gonna keep track of the number of items that are processed by the subscriber. So we know that what we've ended up not being able to handle based on the different strategies. And then we come into the main program. We parse the command line arguments. You'll see there's a bunch of arguments we can use to coordinate the behavior of the different strategies, very, real clever approach to make it easy to test out different approaches in the same program. And then we have the main flowable stream or pipeline where we're going to publish a bunch of random integers in a new thread. And then we're going to go ahead and check for primality in a different thread. So this is going to be the publisher thread. We'll take a look at how that works in a second. And this is gonna be the subscriber thread where we're gonna to check to see each number, whether it's prime. And then when we're done, we're gonna use the Rx Java blocking subscribe terminal operation to essentially handle the results. And you'll see that that works by calling this process next method reference. And if something were to go wrong, if we were to get an exception, uh, then we'll deal with that through this throwable. And otherwise, when we're all finished, we're gonna go ahead and indicate how many prime number checks we actually handled. And depending on the strategies that we use to deal with back pressure, we may handle them all or we may only handle a subset of them. So that's the basic overall flow. And notice at a high level how simple it is to have streams of data coming from one context, in this case, this new thread, and then be handled in a different context. So let's go ahead and take a look and see what Publish Random Integers does. So you can see that Publish Random Integers is helper method that takes a scheduler and returns a flowable. And the way this works is, is actually super cool. Uh, first notice that it's going to subscribe this flowable chain to run on the scheduler. So this is gonna run in that, that new thread that we used when we passed in the, the call to the scheduler up here. Now we're gonna take advantage of one of the features that flowables create provides. Remember, there's a difference between flowable create and observable create, because observable create doesn't know about back pressure strategies, whereas flowable create does. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to create an emitter that's a non-back pressure emitter. So that means it's just going to blast the data out as fast as it can, and it's going to emit a stream of random integers from uh, one to count, where count is a parameter we can set on the command line and we're gonna generate values up to max value, which we'll take a look at. The default is to be gigantic, max integer. And we also pass in this reference to an atomic integer that keeps track of the number of items that are pending. So let's go take a look at make emitter. And you'll see what make emitter does is it's a method that returns something called a flowable on subscribe. And flowable on subscribe is this little wrapper class with a subscribe method that is going to use an emitter to send out the values. And this is what the emitter looks like. So this emitter, which is an emitter, and you can 
You can always, in IntelliJ, if you want to see what the type is, you can always come over here and expand the parameter type. So this is, you can see, it's a flowable emitter. But let's be a little bit more concise and just have it say emitter. But it's something that's going to be able to emit values. And it does that in the means you'll see below. Down here, we have a little functional reactive for loop where we go from one to count and generate count items. We don't actually really care what they are because we're not going to use them here. We're going to generate random integers instead. And then we connect the subscribe operation here. This is the terminal operator. And this is going to increment the current pending item count because we got another item we're about to generate. And then depending on whether we have um, debugging enabled, we're going to go ahead and publish the current item and the current count. And then if we have not been canceled, we emit the next item. And you can see we get the item here by using a random number generator, which generates the next random integer up to max value. So these can be very large, and they will be very large. So that's what happens for every one of these items from one to count. Were something to go wrong, we would emit an error. And when we're all done, we emit on complete. So that's how we terminate this reactive for loop. And then when we're done, we dispose of the flowable after the stream has been processed. So that's how data gets emitted. And again, notice that this data is being emitted in a background thread. And that thread is what's set here with subscribe on. Even though it occurs further down in the pipeline, that's what's uh, determining where this emission is taking place. Now, the second parameter to create is the overflow strategy or the back pressure strategy. And this is, again, a very clever technique where we're going to allow this strategy to be set by a command line flag. We, we default to a particular value. Let's go see what we default to. The default value for the overflow strategy is M for missing, which just says I'm not going to do anything in particular. But we can change it to be drop, buffer, error, or latest if we so desire. So that's how we're going to set the strategy. And that's how the strategy is conveyed to the create method. And we're going to try running this program in a second with a couple of different strategy options. You can see the results differ based on what happens. If we enable the error strategy, then when the subscriber can't keep up with the rate at the publish of the publisher, an exception is thrown. And we go ahead and print that exception. And then we just return an empty flowable at that point. We don't crash the program. We just say, ah, we couldn't keep up, so we're going to bail out. And uh, so that's what Publish Random Integers does. Let's now go take a look at Check for Primality. Notice we're flat mapping this. So Check for Primality is a method that returns a function. And the function is going to take the next number, which is a random number that we generated from that Publish Random Integers uh, publisher method we just looked at. And what this is going to do is it's going to take the number and it's going to emit it. And then it's going to have that take place in another thread. And we can control what thread this is going to run in, what scheduler context. And by default, it's going to run in the single scheduler context, which is just the, the main thread, if you will. Otherwise, it's going to run in the computation scheduler. So this one will have all the subscriptions, all, all the subscriber processing all take place in a single thread, whereas if we use computation, it's going to take place in a pool of threads. So we either have one thread handling the events and, and doing the prime number checking, or we have a pool of threads that are handling the events generated by the publisher and doing random number, uh, doing prime number checking on random numbers. <laughs> and then the last thing we do here, after we've said, go run this thing in this scheduler context, is we actually check to see if the number is prime. And that's not a particularly difficult thing to do. We basically take the prime candidate, which is just the number we've got, this big random integer. And we make a new result record instance. And we record what the result of is prime returns. So is prime is just a method that checks to see if the number is prime. If the number is prime, it returns 0. If the number is not prime, it returns the smallest factor. So that's what happens. Check if prime returns this thing called a prime result. And a prime result is a record. Remember, a Java record is a newer type of data. It's a new, newer type of data creator, if you will, data template. And unlike objects, where you have all this other stuff, so an object will end up with things like 
a virtual pointer because it could have virtual methods. It'll have things like the intrinsic lock. It'll have the intrinsic condition and so on. Unlike objects, records have none of that. They just contain the contents of the fields. And you can see here we have prime candidate and smallest factor. So those are the only things that go into the record. So that's what check for primality does. It returns a function that is then flat mapped together in order to create a flowable of prime results that are these, this record that keeps track of what happened. And then the last thing we do is we use this blocking subscribe to process each event that flows through it. And you can see here, if we're actually printing the results, then we go ahead and indicate whether something was prime, in which case, the, uh, if the prime smallest factor is not equal to zero, it's going to be non-prime. So we print that out. We print out the smallest factor. And otherwise, it's a prime number. So we print that information out as well. So that's basically what's going on in the program. Let's run this program. And uh, to see what we're doing here, we have our command line. In, in IntelliJ, you can provide the command line. So in this case, we're going to turn on debugging. We're going to have a count of 1,000. We're going to use the buffer strategy to start with. And every 100 events, we're going to print some diagnostics out there. That's what all those things mean. Let's go ahead and run this. And you can see a bunch of interesting things from the results we're about to look at. So one of the interesting things you'll be able to see once it starts up and starts to run is that it um, tells you what the count is when it starts. It has the new thread scheduler running and publishing. This thing is emitting. So you can see that every 100 events, it, it just prints something out just to tell you it's still alive and doing something. So it also tells you how many events are queued up that haven't been processed by the subscriber yet. And you can see here that the, uh, most of the work in the publisher is taking place right away. So the publisher thread is running at first. And that's because it's just blasting this stuff out. And it takes a while for the subscriber to determine whether the numbers are prime. So the subscriber cannot keep up one to one with every event that's generated. And that's why you can see that the pending items are growing and growing and growing. And then the, you can see here that we start computing the numbers and, and it's printing out some results here. But then we're publishing way faster than we're able to deal with prime checking in the subscriber. So it's all working. This just kind of shows you what's going on. You can see that the, the uh, scheduler for the, for the subscribers running in the main thread, whereas the publisher subscriber is running in a different thread. That's what main means. It's the main thread. And there's just one thread doing the subscribing. And you'll see when all is said and done, we did indeed complete 1,000 prime number checks. And uh, we're, we're, no data was lost. But that's because um, by default, it buffers the information. So let's see what happens if we come over here and we change this to use a different strategy. So rather than using buffer B, which is what we're using here, we do D for drop. So if we do D for drop and we rerun this thing again, you'll see different behavior because we've changed the we've changed the back pressure strategy. So now you can see that it published a whole bunch of events. It check the primality of some numbers of events. But after 128, it stopped. And that's because the publisher was publishing data faster than the subscriber can keep up with it. And we invoked the drop strategy, which said just drop stuff if the events are showing up faster than we can keep up with them. And you can see that by default, there's a buffer of 128. <laughs> and so it'll buffer 128 of them. But after that, it says drop, 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 drop. So it drops everything. And just for kicks, let's go ahead and rerun this to use E, which is the error, throw an exception way of dealing with overflow and back pressure. And let's see if it, there you go. You can see that when uh, it couldn't keep up, it threw an exception. And the exception said, could not emit value due to lack of requests. What that means is the, the subscriber couldn't get the data fast enough to keep up with the rate at which the publisher was publishing it. So we didn't blow up, but we kind of stopped at that point. And once again, we only completed 128 prime number checks. So this example 
demonstrates some interesting things. It shows how you can have non-back pressure aware publishers and subscribers using back pressure strategies to deal with the publisher generating data faster than the subscriber can keep up. And there's different ways to do it. You can drop, you can buffer, you can throw an exception, and we demonstrated all of those different approaches.